So our next example is going to be radioactive decay. Radioactive is one word. So half-life of radium is 1,600 years. How much will be lost in 100 years? So if I use only intuition and no calculus, the only thing I can really say is less than half. But how much less than half, we'll have to see. If it's more than 1,600 years, it would be more than half. All right, so we're going to set up, obviously, a differential equation for this. So we need some variables. I think we just use the same ones we used last time. X for amount, T for time, in years. This is going to feel a lot like the uh, word problems in Calc 1, related rates, or uh, optimization, where you're saying these are the variables, what they mean. All right, so T time in years, and x equals amount of radon, radium, so it's going to decay, so we can set up our So in this decay, the decay is related to uh, how much is present. So we are going to have the same initial dx dt equals kx, or we'll go with negative kx because we'll be decaying or shrinking. So however much is present, the amount of decay is going to be related to that that much, or the rate of decay. and we do everything we did before, we'll get x equals a e to the negative kt. So those three dots are everything we did yesterday, right there. But now we have to figure out what is a and what is k. We actually might not be able to figure out what a is, that's okay. So half-life of radium is 100, or 1,600 years. That's actually initial condition in disguise. It's a little bit tricky. They don't actually tell us how much is uh, how much we started with or how much is left after 1,600 years. But what I can say is whatever I started with, I got half of that in 1,600 years. So I can write that down. So we saw that A, so A is the initial amount. And we don't know what it is, just looking at this, we don't know, there's no way to determine how much we're starting with right here. So all we see is how much uh, is going to decay, or the amount that's going to decay. So the initial amount, x is really a function of t, so you can write it as x of t, like this. That'll be better for our notation we're about to do. So we see x of 0 equals a without knowing anything, just plugging in 0 for t. Uh, e to the 0 reduces to 1. What is the other time value I have some information about? 1600. How much is, what is our amount at 1600 years? A over 2. So there's the half-life we just used. So whatever we start with, 1,600 years, we got half that. So we can go ahead and plug these in, and we should be able to get k out of this. We do have two initial conditions, but they still have an unknown in them. 
So generally, each initial condition will give you one variable, uh, one constant. So we really only had one initial condition, and this is how it's written out. And let's go ahead and keep plugging these in. So this is a e to the uh, 0. And this one is a e to the negative k times 1,600. So the first equation is not going to lead to anything useful. We'll just get a equals a. The second equation, however, so we're just looking at this piece here. So multiply, we can just divide both sides by a. 1 half equals e to the negative k times 1,600. And we have one equation with only one unknown. We should be able to get to k. So how do we get k out of the exponent? So we'll do natural log both sides. Ln 1 half equals negative k times 1,600. What type of algebra did I do to get to that final answer? Yeah, so made both sides negative. So negative. So I did that move right there. So I just made the natural log negative by reciprocating the inside part. And whatever number this is, is k. It's going to be a tiny number because it takes forever to get half as much. So that k value is going to be really small. And we can put our, well, that's just k. Our final xt equation, a e to the negative. Let's actually use this negative k right here. And I can just write a e to that ln 1 half over 1,600. And that number, whatever number that is, times t. So was our original question, how much is left, or how much is lost in 100 years? So we're going to plug in 100 for t and figure out what we get. So we're figuring uh, amount after 100 years. So we get a little reduction in the power. So that'll be ln 1 half over 16. We should be able to clean this up. Let's write as e to the ln of 1 half to the 1 16th power. So I use the product of powers is a power of a power. Except the uh, divided by 16 is really multiplied by 1 16th right there. And now I can cancel the ELN. So this is A 1 half to the 1 16th power. So that's going to be a number very close to 1. And whatever that amount is, that'll be the proportion of A that's remaining. Anybody have a handy calculator or a phone? You can get some decimal. Imagine it's probably 0.9 something. 
have so many sets. All right, so, and that's uh, approximation, or is that the exact? Uh, that, was that must be the approximation. Yeah. There's no, yeah, squid. All right, so this is the amount after 100 years. So you got about 95% of your what you started with. So there is a definition for intervals in your book. You don't you're not going to learn anything by this, but just to be complete and they do use the funky equal sign. In my notes, I have a colon, I colon A less than or equal to <coughs> X less or equal to B. And that's going to be the same as what you're used to. So I don't think they use interval notation that heavily in your textbook. Uh, they use a lot of the inequality notation, and I like interval notation more. So I'm going to use less interval and more, uh, or more interval notation than your textbook uses. And you can see how we got lazy over time. Back in whatever 1960s when this book was written, there was a double equal sign under less than symbol. And now we just got lazy and write one of the two equal signs right there. So function of one independent variable. So if two variables are related in a way such that the value of one is uniquely determined by the other. And we say are related, we mean by an equation. In a way such that one variable, let's go with A for this variable. Actually, we'll go with B. is uniquely determined by the other variable. And we'll call the other one A. Uh, then B is a function of A. So that means you could write it as b equals f of a. Another way to think about it, algebraically, you could solve for b without having any like plus minus or b could be this or this other thing. So if they are both uniquely determined by the other, Then also, A is a function of B. And you can write this, I should write IE. This function will have a different name, we'll go G of B. So 
So we can say a little bit more about these functions f and g. How do you think these functions are related? So if you got some equation with two variables and you can solve, basically solve for either variable, a or b. They'll be inverses of each other. And we can see that by writing, let's see, g of b equals g of, so I'm just looking up here, b equals f of a. g of b equals, I just took out the b. So I took out, I took g of b, and then for this b, I just substituted in this f of a right there. So I had g of b equals g of f of a. And this started out equaling a. So we got right there, a equals g of f of a. Also, we'll start with the b equals f of a. So now I am starting, I'm starting on this equation and I'm going to replace a, uh, the a by g of b right there. So right here we see that g of f of a equals a and f of g of b equals b. So that's what it takes to say two functions are inverses. So make sure you have f g of f equal the identity and f of g equal the identity. So g equals f inverse and f equals g inverse. So they are inverses of each other, these two functions. So compare the area and side length of a square. <coughs> and we'll go side length, we'll call side length x of a square. So there's my square. And I want you to write an equation to relate a and x. Hint, it's very easy. So you probably wrote a equals x squared. So which one is a function of the other? So if we go back up to function one independent variable, all right, so are two variables related? We got an equation with two variables, so we got the first part of this. In such a way, can you solve for one variable? Yep, it's already written out like that. So if you knew what x was, you would immediately know what a is right away. So just written out like this, this means a is a function of x. Now if we could say, we, we could try to solve for x algebraically, we get this. Uh, if you throw away the negative and say x has to be zero or more, you also can determine area, or determine uh, x from the area. So 
So if, if x is going to be greater than or equal to 0, then x can be determined by a. If x is allowed to be negative, then all you could say is x is plus this or minus this. You couldn't actually say exactly which of the two x would be. Now we're going to look at function of two independent variables. So most of you are fresh out of Calc 3, where we looked at functions that had two inputs and three inputs. So this will be very familiar for those of you coming from Calc 3. Uh, but we have the definition here, and we'll just use x and y. If x and y uniquely determine z, then we can write z equals f of x comma y. So if we look at the domain of f, domain of f is going to be actually points. That have, each point is going to have an x and a y coordinate. So one way to write that, domain of f is a subset of R2. So regular functions that have one dimensional inputs, their domains are subsets of the real numbers of R1. And this function has two inputs, so its domain is going to be points in two-dimensional space. Now, chances are it won't be all points in two-dimensional space. So we did quite a bit in Calc 3 of finding domains for these functions. We'll just do one example here. So we got a fraction, and we'll do square root 1 minus y squared on the top, square root 1 minus x squared on the bottom. All right, there's really three domain rules you have to look out for. What are uh, the, dom the three domain rules you have to look out for? So do not divide by 0, to no, oh, I think in this class we can just say keep, keep it real, no roots of negatives. There's a third one. What was the third rule? Logarithms have their inputs have to be zero, have to be more than zero, greater than zero. So let's just write it as log a of x has the restriction x has to be between 0 and infinity, or x is greater than 0. And a little note of caution on the first one, don't divide by 0. This could be hidden in a trig function, like cotangent, tangent, secant, cosecant. It might be a little bit hidden as a reciprocal trig function. We're used to looking for them in rational functions, but they happen just as well in all the reciprocal trig functions. 
All right, domain rules. Let's apply them to this function right here. So I got two square roots going on. I got to make sure the numerator square root is real. So let's go for numerator first. So we could solve for y squared. You can do quadratics without graphing, but I don't necessarily recommend it. Uh, if we do this one without graphing, let's factor it. So that's the difference of squares right there. How do you get a product to be positive? Product of two numbers. They're either both positive. What's the other option? Both negative, because two wrongs make a right when you multiply. So they're both positive, both negative. So we can draw a number line. It should be pretty obvious that zero, or no, negative one and positive one. Yeah, those are the two values that make it zero. So those your zero values. So we have to decide that positive or negative in these three parts of the y-axis. Maybe I should be drawing a vertical y-axis. All right, let's plug in zero. That's right in between. If I plug in zero, do I get positive or negative? from this expression here. Positive. So we're going to get 1 times 1, so we get positive 1. What about, uh, let's go with 2 up here. What do I get if I plug in 2? 1 minus 2 is negative, 1 times 1 plus 2 is positive. So I'm going to get negative up here, and plug in negative 2, I'll also get negative down here. So we have our y is only going to be positive between negative 1 and positive 1, right there. So we get the y is between negative 1 and positive 1. Any questions on that? Let's look at the denominator. So we have two things to worry about. Don't divide by 0, and make sure your square root is real. So we could look for bad x's that way. Set it equal to 0, find the bad x's. This should be pretty obvious which ones are bad. Uh, but we also need to make sure that we have a real value so that the inside of the square root is also not negative. So we have to worry about the whole thing being negative, being zero, and also the inside uh, being zero or more. So we could combine these two together. Uh, the square root is zero at this exact same time, the inside equals zero. I should write, let's throw out the bad one. So I don't want that square root to be 0, which is equivalent to the expression not being 0. So I can combine both of these together into this inequality. So it needs to be greater than 0 and not equal. So we had a greater than or equal 0 and not equal. Both of those conditions mean just greater. And we saw this almost the exact same way, except it's x's now. Minus 1 and 1. The only difference is we're not allowed to use minus 1 and 1 anymore. Because we said not equal, but greater than. So those are out. And I plugged in values and did a positive, negative, a sign graph. Let's, do, let's use our knowledge of parabolas here. Is this? You could write this as negative x squared plus 1. Happy or sad parabola? Sad parabola. Sad parabola shifted up 1. So 
So if I graph it really quickly, it's going to look like that. Sad parabola shifted up one. So we got negative, positive, negative. You can also do it that way if you know what the graph will look like. I could just as well have plugged in the same three, except they'd be x values this time. I could have plugged in three x values, gotten minus plus minus. So I want to go negative one to one. Except this time, it needs to be open because we're not allowed to pick negative one or one. That would make us divide by zero in our original function at the top there. So we have to satisfy both of these conditions at the same time. So a good thing to do is graph them out on xy plane. So we'll go ahead and graph those two out. Go with blue here. So y is between negative 1 and 1. x is between negative 1 and 1. And we're going to use dotted lines or dashed lines because I'm not allowed to equal uh, negative 1 or 1 for x. So I don't include those vertical boundaries right there. And if we go and shade in our region, it'll be everything oh, it's not the best color. That rectangle right there is our domain. So you have to be a little bit careful. Uh, I won't get too technical on the endpoints. The only time it's a little bit ambiguous if you're up in the corner, the four corners. So it should be pretty clear that uh, anything <coughs> on the left boundary is not included. Anything on the right boundary is not included. Uh, anything on the top battery is included. Anything on the bottom battery is included. But then what happens when you're at the corner? So I'll go with the green. Is that point included or not included? Not included because of the fact that it's the x coordinate that makes it bad. So that's not included. We're going to. Let's undo this, and we'll just cut out that piece. So we'll just cut little holes right here. And we'll fill back in. There we go. So that is a very detailed view of what our rectangle looks like. So it's open on the sides and that forces the corners to be open. So there's a domain and it is a subset of two-dimensional space. They won't all be rectangles, but we won't do too much focus on domains. We probably focused way more on domains in calculus class than we're going to focus on domains here, but occasionally we will look at them. So that was function of two independent variables and the domain. And next we have a definition, a region. A subset is the region. Subset S of R2 is a region if each element X is an interior point.
So what is an interior point? I'll talk about that in a minute. And we'll go, the other condition is S is connected. Which means any <coughs> X1, X2, and S, there exists a path She's a scary letter gamma uh, in S that connects X1 and X2. So we talked about paths in calculus class. I'm not going to talk too much about that or really anything about them right now. Just think uh, it's probably better to give examples. So we'll do some examples. So we'll go with non-regions first. All right, so every point needs to be an interior point. So that right there tells you if you include the boundary, you're not a region because all the points on the boundary are not interior. So any set including the boundary is not a region. All the inside points are interior, but all the points that are on the boundary are not interior points right here. So all these points on the, along the boundary are preventing it from being a region. Time your boundaries included, you're not a region. So, what about if we just have some generic blob like this? Uh, it will be a region. Every point has some space around it that is also inside the set. Yep. So, every uh, point inside has a neighborhood around it, making it an interior point. But if you have a second blob if you have a second blob you would not be able to connect any two points with the path so you got x1 and one part x2 another part if I draw any path between the two no matter what I will be going outside to get to the other one. So my path won't live inside of that region. So this would be not connected. I'll just color this part of the path in red. That's the part of the path that would not be connected right there. There would be no path to connect these two that's inside, that's entirely inside the region. Connected means exactly what it, the intuition tells you. It means there's two separate pieces that are not touching. So those are region, or those are non-regions. So regions are uh, connected, basically connected open subsets. where we'll take open to mean uh, has no boundary. And I don't want to give a whole lesson on boundary and open and interior points, so we'll just, uh, I think, stick with this, this level of explanation for now. Now, to confuse things more, there is an idea of bounded 
which is not to be confused with boundary, even though they have the same first part of the word. So bounded a bounded region is any region that can be contained in a large circle. So we'll write down a, let's write down a region. So we'll do an example region in set notation. So it needs to be a subset of R2, so it'll look like XY such that. We'll go with uh, let's take X to be greater than Oop, it better not be equal to zero. X greater than zero. And we'll go Y is in between negative one and one. So we can graph this out, X greater than zero. That's the X equals zero line, Y is between negative one and one. Uh, if I put this on a coordinate axis, there's the y, there's the x-axis. All right, so first of all, is this a region? All right, is it connected? Any two points? You could actually make a straight line path between any two points in this, and that whole entire path will be inside this rectangle. All right. Now points, any point you pick in here uh, is an interior point. So if I pick any point over here, I can put a little space around it, and that's an interior point. Now things might get a little weird. What about really big x values? Well, whatever x value you're thinking of, let's just say it's right there. So you're thinking of 10 trillion, well that's 10 trillion. So as long as your y value is not negative one or one, you'll have some space around it. You can go a little bit smaller, a little bit bigger in the X, and a little smaller, a little bigger in the Y. So this is a region right here. No matter how big your X coordinate gets, you can always put a small neighborhood around it that's inside your region. Is this bounded? Nope, go to the right as far as you want. So no matter what circle you draw with whatever radius you want, I can make this, uh, or not, I can make this, I can pick an x value that's way bigger than what will be contained in your circle. So the biggest circle you can think of, we'll just go a little bit further to the right and pick an x value. So no matter how big your circle is, this region, you can't cover it because it goes forever to the right. So there's a few ways to draw that. You could just draw a couple of arrows, just continue those two dash lines with arrows right, right there to signal that it goes all the way to the right. If you really want to do a little overkill, you could do that right there to show the entire side going over to the right.